We can stop HIV, Iowa. And it all starts with health equity. Health equity means that everyone has a fair and just opportunity to be healthy. To achieve this, we need to remove obstacles to good health. Poverty and discrimination support an environment in which HIV thrives. We must work together so that all Iowans have access to the resources they need to prevent, diagnose, and to treat HIV. Visit StopHIVIowa.org. This is Space Time, Series 20, Episode 18, for broadcast on the 6th of March, 2017. This edition of Space Time is brought to you by Audible.com. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at www.audibletrial.com forward slash space time. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle or your MP3 player. That's audibletrial.com forward slash space time for your free audiobook. Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You can download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast just about everywhere, including iTunes, Stitcher, Pocket Casts, Bytes.com, YouTube, SoundCloud, Audioboom, and from SpaceTimeWithStuartGary.com. The show is also broadcast coast-to-coast across the United States on Science 360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C. Coming up on Space Time, searching for nearby giant planets... Supernova 1987A, 30 years on, and rocket science in the Arctic to better understand the Aurora Borealis. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Astronomers believe there could be a large population of as-yet undetected giant planets and brown dwarfs within our stellar neighbourhood. The findings, reported in the Astrophysical Journal Supplement Series, are based on a study of an association of stars called TW Higher, located about 100 light-years away, which is just down the road in astronomical terms. The study's lead author, Jonathan Gagney from Carnegie University, believes the stellar association may contain a large number of undetected bright substellar objects, similar to giant exoplanets. Astronomers describe stellar associations as groups of similarly aged stars all moving through space together as an association. They're all of similar ages because they all originated in the same stellar nursery. And this TW Higher group contains several dozen 10 million year old low mass stars all moving through space together. Stellar associations are fascinating places because they're prime targets to hunt for brown dwarfs as well as free floating rogue planets. Brown dwarfs fill the gap between the largest Jupiter mass planets and the smaller stars, known as red dwarfs. Often referred to as failed stars, brown dwarfs don't contain enough mass to commence the hydrogen nuclear fusion process in their cores, which makes normal main sequence stars like our Sun shine. However, brown dwarfs of more than, say, 13 Jupiter masses are thought to be capable of fusing deuterium and burning lithium. Free floating or rogue planets are exoplanets that are no longer orbiting their host star. They've been kicked out of their original systems either by some sort of gravitational perturbation or by some stellar event. And recent studies of the TW Higher Association have revealed some of the first known isolated planet-sized objects in the Sun's stellar neighbourhood. In order to determine whether or not there are more standalone planetary mass objects like these in the association, Gagne and colleagues calculated the association's initial mass function. Initial mass function can be used to determine the distribution of mass within a group and thereby predict the number of undiscovered objects that could exist inside that group. The analysis allowed the team to conclude that there could be many more objects between, say, 5 and 7 Jovian masses in this association which have not yet been discovered. Gagne says the TW Higher Association extends out to a distance of about 250 light years, well beyond the sensitivity of current instruments to detect planetary mass objects. Interestingly, previous studies examining the TW Higher Association using both NASA's Chandra and the European Space Agency's XMEM Newton X-ray space telescopes have detected huge torrents of X-ray radiation emanating from the young stars in the system. The level of radiation generated was considered strong enough to significantly shorten the lifetimes of the planetary-forming disks of gas and dust surrounding these stars. 
Researchers found evidence that the intense X-ray radiation produced by some of the young stars in the association had heated disk material, causing it to evaporate into deep space, thereby destroying the disk. Until these findings, it had been unclear as to whether or not X-ray radiation from such small faint stars would be powerful enough to affect their planet-forming disks of material. However, the results clearly suggest that a faint star's X-ray output may play a significant and crucial role in determining the survival time of its protoplanetary disk. The researchers found that relative to their total energy output, the more massive stars produced more X-rays than less massive ones. Using NASA's Wide Field Infrared Survey Explorer Space Telescope, as well as ground-based spectroscopy, the authors found that all of the more massive stars in the group had already lost their protoplanetary disks. However, they were able to detect planetary forming disks around some of the least massive stars in the association. These results mean astronomers may have to revisit existing ideas on the formation process and early lives of planets around these faint stars. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. Three decades ago, astronomers spotted one of the brightest exploding stars in more than 400 years. The massive stellar blast called Supernova 1987A blazed with the power of 100 million suns for several months following its discovery on February 23, 1987. Since that historic first sighting, Supernova 1987A has continued to fascinate astronomers with its spectacular stellar light show. Located on the outskirts of a massive star-forming region known as the Tarantula Nebula in the Large Magellanic Cloud, a nearby dwarf galaxy some 168,000 light-years away, 1987A is the largest nearby supernova explosion observed in modern times. That is, since Galileo Galilei first pointed his telescope at the heavens back in the early days of the 17th century. 1987A has therefore provided astronomers with their best opportunity yet to study the evolution of the supernova death of a star. Approximately two to three hours before the visible light from the supernova reached Earth, a burst of neutrinos was detected at three separate neutrino observatories. It's thought this was caused by neutrino emission, which occurs simultaneously with a core collapse but precedes the emission of visible light. The transmission of visible light is a much slower process that occurs only after the core collapse shock waves reach the stellar surface. Four days after the supernova was detected, astronomers tentatively identified the progenitor star as a blue supergiant known as Sandalek minus 69202. After the supernova faded, that observation was confirmed as Sandalek minus 69202 had disappeared. Mind you, this was an unexpected identification. That's because previous models for high-mass stellar evolution didn't predict that blue supergiants would be susceptible to supernova events. For a while there, there was some speculation that the star may have merged with an unseen companion star before going supernova. However, it's now widely understood that blue supergiants are the natural progenitors of supernovae, although there's still some speculation that the evolution of these stars may well require mass loss from a binary companion. Blue supergiants are hot, luminous evolved stars which started their lives as spectral type O and B blue stars on the main sequence. These are the largest, most massive stars seen in the universe today, ranging from 10 to hundreds of times the mass of our Sun. But they're also considered the James Deans of stellar evolution, living fast and dying young, with lifespans measured in only millions of years rather than the billions of years for sun-like stars or the trillions of years for red dwarf stars. Blue supergiants have surface temperatures of 10,000 to 50,000 Kelvin and luminosities 10,000 to a million times that of the sun. Now, interestingly, core collapse supernovae like 1987A should result in the formation of a neutron star, given the mass of the progenitor. And the neutrino data from the event indicates that a compact object did form at the star's core. However, despite intensive observations, no neutron star has ever been detected. Astronomers are still trying to work out exactly what happened to the apparent missing neutron star. Now, it could simply mean that the neutron star is enshrouded in dense dust clouds and so can't yet be seen. It could also be that the pulsar may have an unusually large or small magnetic field, which is interfering with our observations. But the most intriguing possibility is that so much material fell back on the neutron star that it further collapsed 
forming a black hole, an object of infinite density but zero dimensions. Virtually every major telescope on the Earth's surface, as well as those orbiting the planet, have focused their attention at some stage onto supernova 1987A. NASA's Hubble Space Telescope has repeatedly observed 1987A since 1990, accumulating hundreds of images. In the years following the supernova event, Hubble detected three bright rings around 1987A, which were identified as material coming from the stellar wind of the progenitor star. Gas in these rings was ionised by the ultraviolet flash from the supernova explosion. The gas consequently began glowing for decades, emitting in various emission lines. Then, around 2001, the expanding supernova ejector, travelling at over 7,000 km per second, collided with the inner ring. This caused its heating and the generation of X-rays. In fact, the X-ray flux from the ring increased by a factor of 3 between 2001 and 2009. Recent observations by Hubble have revealed that the dense ring of gas around the supernova is still glowing in optical light and now has a diameter of about a light year. Meanwhile, the central structure visible inside the ring has now grown to roughly half a light year across. Most notable are two blobs of debris at the centre of the supernova remnant. They're now racing away from each other at roughly 40 million kilometres an hour. Images from both the Hubble Space Telescope and the Very Large Telescope in Chile, taken between 1994 and 2014, shows that the emissions from the clumps of matter making up the ring are now fading as the clumps are being destroyed by the supernova shockwave. It's predicted the ring should fade away between 2020 and 2030. Meanwhile, NASA's Chandra X-ray Space Telescope, which began observing the supernova from shortly after its deployment in space in 1999, has also observed the expanding ring of X-ray emission as it steadily grew brighter. However, from about February 2013 until the last Chandra observation analysed in September 2015, the total amount of low-energy X-rays has remained constant and part of the ring has started to fade. These changes provide evidence that the supernova shockwave is moving beyond the dense ring of gas produced late in the life of the progenitor star when a fast outflow of stellar wind from the star collided with a slower wind generated by an earlier red giant phase of the star's evolution. This all represents the end of an era for supernova 1987A. The explosion's blast wave has now moved beyond the ring into a region with less dense gas. What lies beyond the rings poorly known at present, and it all really depends on details of the evolution of the star during its red giant phase. Kari Frank from Penn State University, who led the latest Chandra study, says the details of this transition will give astronomers a better understanding of the life of the Doob star and how it ended. The 30 years of observations of 1987A are important because they provide unique insights into the last stages of stellar evolution. Supernovae such as 1987A can stir up surrounding gas, triggering the formation of new stars and planets. The gas from which these stars and planets form will be enriched with elements such as carbon, nitrogen, oxygen and iron, which are the basic components for life as we know it. As Carl Sagan famously said, we are all star stuff. That's because these elements are forged both inside the pre-supernova star and during the supernova explosion itself. They're then dispersed into the host galaxy by the expanding supernova remnants. Therefore, continued studies of 1987A should give a unique insight into the early stages of this dispersal. A supernova remnant cools quickly, therefore within just a few years, the heavy elements formed in the star can form molecules and condense into dust, turning the remnant into a veritable dust factory. Beginning in 2012, astronomers used ALMA, the Atacama Large Millimeter Submillimeter Array Telescope, to observe the glowing remnants of the supernova, studying how the remnants actually forging vast amounts of new dust from the new elements created in the progenitor star. A portion of this dust will make its way into interstellar space, where it will become building blocks for future stars and planets in another system. These observations also suggest that dust in the early universe likely also formed from similar supernova explosions. In fact, it was exactly such a supernova event which is thought responsible for the collapse of a molecular gas and dust cloud that eventually formed our sun and solar system 4.6 billion years ago. Jonathan Nally is the editor of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine. Yeah, this was the big one, as you say. Biggest, brightest supernova for uh, about 400 years, yeah, since the telescope was invented. This was one that astronomers had been waiting for. They, because 
they had lots of theories about how stars explode and which types of stars explode and how it how it all happens. And they had seen them in distant galaxies. They would flare up just briefly and then sort of die away again. So you get a bit of information there. But they were waiting for a really big close one so that they could watch it not for a matter of days but for weeks or months. Or and years, in this case, they've been watching out, this yeah. one. Yeah, 30 years they've been watching this one now. Yeah, quite amazing. It's a bit of a hard luck story, too, for Australian astronomy because uh, we almost discovered it, but we sort of just missed out. Yeah, oh, this is really tragic. It's almost as bad as reading out the wrong name at the Oscars or something. Um, yeah, what happened was uh, when these things happen, someone gets credited with the discovery. And usually with things, certainly back in those days, usually things were, first of all, spotted by one person and they report it to the, the place where all these reports go. Yeah and then that's your discovery and some classes of uh, astronomical event get named after you and other classes of astronomical things don't but you still have a discoverer in this case it was spotted by um, three people within hours of each other in South America and in New Zealand so there are three people who are credited with discovering supernova 1987a but there was an astronomer here in Australia who was religiously taking photographs of the southern sky every night, every night, every night, looking for things like supernovae or novae or, or comets or anything like that, anything that might be changing in the night sky. And religiously, he would take these photographs and in the morning, he'd take the film out of the camera and get it processed and have a look and see if anything popped up overnight. This was the night he didn't take the film out of the camera and get it processed and take a look at it. So by the time he came to see this enormous bright light on this photograph he'd taken, it was too late. It had already been reported, and these other guys got the credit for the discovery. Really disappointing. And if you looked at the time when the image was taken, he would have seen it first. He would have been the first to spot it, yeah, exactly, and the first to report it. But I was going to say that despite that, this man is a very well-respected astronomer, and he's discovered comets and asteroids and, and a different type of star called Novi, which are stars that brighten very very highly accomplished astronomer um this is the one that got away anyway you can't be everywhere all the time yeah this happens to all of us i had the same problem when i was a journalist working at the abc's newsroom in newcastle which is just north of sydney and uh, the local headmaster from newcastle high school rang me up to tell me about this bunch of kids that had just started a band and they were doing really well and they're going to be big things and all mm -hmm. that and i thought oh yeah wasn't really interested in the story about a bunch of kids after all every school has a bunch of kids with a band anyway this group of kids eventually became silver chair you mean they became superstars <laughs> exactly so you could have discovered your own superstar mate oh, i don't know about me discovering them well they would have been they would have been going i remember our first ever interview on on the radio yeah it was a guy called stuart gary yeah whatever whatever happened to him yeah that's right <laughs> that's what they could have. yeah oh well the one that got away for you too mate uh, yeah. it happens to all of us i'm afraid it does it does well look supernova 1987a yeah 30 years later they're still watching not the supernova itself but the sort of aftermath of it, the sort of afterglow. and Well, it's a question of what happens next. What's going to happen with all this dust that the supernova is now produced? We're going to now, using things like ALMA, try and determine exactly how that dust from the explosion is cooling down and forming molecules and being implanted into future generations of stars and planets. It's a pretty good coincidence of time, really, that this thing happened back then and not too far away in the, in the neighbouring galaxy, the Large Magellanic Cloud, that it's still around in the era now where we have these super sophisticated telescopes and space telescopes and all the computing power you need and all these amazing cameras and things. Uh, if it had happened 100 years ago, then they would have been able to you know, study it a bit for weeks and weeks afterwards, but it would have faded away and they wouldn't have been able to do anything more. It's just fortunate that we're living in this amazing era, this technological era, the 21st century, with all this fantastic scientific gear they've got. I mean, all the planets they're finding around other stars, the stuff that they can learn from uh, well, look at the Trappist-1 discovery data. last week. The Trappist-1 discovery, it's staggering what can find there because I remember speaking to an astronomer about probably 25 years ago saying, you know, do you think we'll ever, ever get pictures of planets around other stars? Oh, no, 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 no. No, no, too far away, too small, uh, signal to noise, you know, stars too bright, planets too dim, we'll never do that. Well, they're already starting to get some pictures. And, of course, the mysteries about 1987A aren't over yet. We still don't know what was left after the blast. We don't know if it's a neutron star, we don't know if it's a black hole because we haven't seen it yet. No, that's right. We haven't seen it yet. In the early days, 
it was the expectation was there would have been a neutron star there probably and we have the radio gear to be able to pick up the radio pulses from the neutron star uh, and everyone was very very eagerly 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 all, every astronomer who had a telescope who could see it just turned their telescope onto this thing for weeks and weeks and weeks at a time and of course Australia was in the box seat with its um, radio telescopes and things and no we didn't pick up any signals from a rotating neutron star or pulsar so they thought well maybe it was a black hole that was formed but I'm not sure of that either can't really tell so no sign whatsoever so far so yeah that is a remaining mystery of the whole thing out of plenty of other mysteries with 1987a we do know a lot about what happened we do know a lot about the star that did go bang we know a lot of what's happened since but that mystery what actually happened to the remnant of the star did it collapse down to a neutron star or did it collapse further to become a black hole, uh, we, just, we just don't know. That's Jonathan Nally, the editor of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine. And this is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. OK, let's take a break from the show and talk about one of our sponsors. Audible's offering a free audiobook download with a 30-day trial to give you an opportunity to check out their service. Audible have over 180,000 different titles to choose from, such as Contact by Carl Sagan or A Brief History in Time by Stephen Hawking. Others include the unabridged version of The Hobbit by R.R. Tolkien, Divergent by Veronica Roth, and Born to Run by Bruce Springsteen. So many great books, no matter what your taste. Over 180,000 titles to choose from. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com forward slash spacetime. That's audibletrial.com forward slash spacetime for your free audiobook. Or you can click on the link at spacetimewithstuartgary.com. And now, back to our show. NASA has launched five rockets in the high Arctic to provide a better understanding of auroral activity. The program, which began in January, involves three separate experiments using five rockets launching from the Perka Flat Research Range north of Fairbanks, Alaska. The launches all use 20-metre-long two-stage Black Brant 9 sounding rockets on suborbital ballistic flights lasting up to 20 minutes and reaching altitudes of up to 500 kilometres. Although these sounding rockets don't fly fast enough to get into orbit around the Earth, they do provide low-cost access to space, giving scientists valuable information about the Sun, the local space environment, as well as the Earth and its atmosphere. Sounding rockets are also ideal for testing instruments for future satellite missions. They fly high above most of Earth's atmosphere, allowing them to see certain types of light, such as extreme ultraviolet and X-rays, which don't make it all the way to the ground because they're absorbed by the atmosphere. These kinds of light give scientists a unique view of the sun as well as other processes in space. Sounding rockets are the ideal vehicle for this type of study because they can fly directly through auroras, which exist in a region of Earth's upper atmosphere too high for scientific balloons and too low for satellites. The 2017 Alaska Sounding Rocket campaign began in January with the launch of the Polar Night Nitric Oxide or Polonox mission to study Earth's polar atmosphere. The flight for Virginia Tech was designed to measure atmospheric nitric oxide levels produced by auroral activity. These nitric oxygen levels can build up to large concentrations capable of destroying ozone. Polar Knox's scientific equipment included ultraviolet spectrographs to measure how much nitric oxide is in the atmosphere and where most of it tends to linger. Polar Knox was followed by the launch of two sounding rockets as part of the Neutral Jets in Auroral Arcs mission for NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland. Auroral Arcs was designed to collect data on winds influenced by electric fields related to auroral activity. At high latitudes, magnetospheric energy and momentum have profound effects on the ionosphere and associated upper atmosphere. Energetic electrons travelling along Earth's magnetic field lines interact with neutral gases, creating regions of enhanced thermal plasma. Magnetospheric DC electric fields map along the magnetic field lines, setting the ionosphere in motion by way of plasma drifts. The plasma drifts then set the neutral gases in motion through collisions between the ion and neutral gases. The main objective of the mission is to understand the height-dependent coupling processes that create localised neutral jets in the upper atmosphere associated with the auroras, their driving conditions and their associated heating and neutral structuring. The auroral neutral jets experiment used two rockets launched simultaneously. One had an aperture of 175 kilometres, the other 350 kilometres. 
Each rocket was fitted with plasma and neutral gas detectors, as well as electric and magnetic field detectors. The high and low platforms allowed scientists to determine the jet characteristics simultaneously at different altitudes and show how the driving electric field and particle input vary within the 150 to 300 km range. The third experiment was part of the Isinglass mission. Isinglass is short for ionospheric structuring in situ and ground-based low-altitude studies. The mission included two sounding rockets designed to launch into different types of auroral activity in order to collect data on their structure with the hope of better understanding the processes that create them. Auroras are caused when charged particles from the sun and trapped in Earth's magnetic field are sent raining down into the atmosphere, usually triggered by geomagnetic storms on the sun. The visible light produced in the atmosphere as auroral activity is the final step in the chain of processes connecting the solar wind from the sun with the Earth's atmosphere. Scientists from Dartmouth College in New Hampshire want to understand what structures can tell them about the electrodynamic processes higher up. Scientists at the range had to wait until conditions were just right before they could launch. That included the winds, the weather and also the scientific conditions. And since these rockets were studying auroral activity, it meant they also had to wait until the sky was lit up with the northern lights. Regions near the North and South Pole are best for studying auroral activity because the shape of Earth's magnetic field lines naturally funnels aurora-causing particles towards the North and South magnetic poles. But launching sensitive instruments near the Arctic Circle in winter has its own unique challenges. For example, the rockets had to be insulated with foam or blankets every time they were taken outside, including while on the launch pad, because of the extremely low temperatures. This is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. And that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, and from SpaceTimeWithStuartGary.com. The show is also broadcast coast-to-coast across the United States on Science360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C. This is Space Time with Stuart Gary. For more, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter and Tumblr. Just search for Space Time with Stuart Gary. Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe.